my neighbors uh, are moving in or something today, new neighbors or whatever. So you might hear some pounding here and there. Uh, so are we all ready now? Yes. All right. So what are we talking about today? How to make chicken soup? I think that's our topic. It's the same, same, you know, because whatever you talk about, um, it's always this. What does that mean? You may have heard teachers say that. It's this all, all the time. Always. It's this. This is it. So when we're looking for non-duality, where do we look? So non-duality means not to. It's, it's simple. It's not, it's not very complicated. So if it means not to, then um, it can't be. There is no other. There's not two. That's why this is it. What does it mean? This, whatever is happening right now, including my neighbors banging on the walls right now, this is non-duality appearing as this. So non-duality expresses itself as duality. That which has no name, I'm calling it non-duality. You know, sometimes I call it the unmanifest, the self, um, whatever it is. Uh, the soul, you can call it the soul if you want. Whatever word you use is never correct anyway. So it really doesn't matter. It's unknowable, it's unnameable. But let's say the soul, you can only know it by its appearances. And this is its appearance right now in this moment. It's sitting, looking at a screen. That's its appearance right now. So in order to find non-duality, where do we need to go? Well, there is nowhere to go. There is no other. There's no second, not two. So if there's no second, then there is nowhere to go. So then the mind, a lot of times on the spiritual path, what it tries to do is say, okay, well, to get to non-duality, I need to get rid of duality. But that's a fool's game because the joke is duality isn't real in the first place. This is just the appearance of non-duality. In other words, if the unmanifest, the soul, non-duality, the nothing, the pure potential, whatever name you want to give it. If that took shape and form, what would that look like? Well, here it is. This is what it looks like. Is there a moment when that's not true? Never. It's always this moment. It's always non-duality appearing as this. There's nothing you can do to make non-duality into duality. There's no amount of people on the earth that can convince, that can make non-duality into a multiplicity. The number of appearances doesn't change the fact that it's still the same unmanifest non-dual source, knowing itself through multiplicity. Non-duality knowing itself through duality. The unmanifest knowing itself through manifestation. But all of this manifestation never actually happened. Nothing's really happening. Yeah. If something was really happening, this was really real, then non duality wouldn't be the case. The case would be multiplicity because you're real and 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 everybody's real. Yeah. But nobody's real. That's the whole point in no self. There is no self other than another name for it, the self. There is no self other than the self. So the whole seeking for the self is already too late. That's what we called last week's meeting. Everything is too late. Anything you do to find what already is the case is too late. And the one that's doing something is only a misidentification. It's a mistake that you take yourself to be someone in space and time, someone who was born and is now looking for God or for himself or for whatever will complete him or her. Yeah. And as I like to point out every time, nothing will ever complete you, ever. Nothing. The one who's seeking completion is a phantom. So a phantom being not real can never find completion anyway. And who would want to find completion for a phantom anyway? It's not real. So so the existence of, of me as Daniel or of Lisa or of Sib or of Sirkan or of Christine or of Ashwin, all of that 
is part of the play. We don't need to get rid of it, but we only need to understand what it really is. What is it really? It's the non-duality. It's not a real Ashwin. It's not a real Daniel. It's not a real Lisa. Not really. So, so all of existence is not really. Or the way I have said it before, it's a maybe. Non-duality, pure potentiality can appear maybe as this. Look, this is one possibility. And then in the next moment, maybe like this. This is another possibility. In the next moment, the neighbors are pounding again. That's another possibility. It's just possibility knowing itself in every possibility. But possibility is just a possible reality. Maybe it's like this. Maybe it's like that. It's not a solid reality. It doesn't really take place because it doesn't actually have any effect. It doesn't change anything at all. By all the change that happens in this dream, nothing at all changes. By all the differences that appear in the dream, no actual difference is made. There isn't anything to be different. The non-duality is always itself. So it, whatever it is, it's unknowable, is always itself, and it only knows itself through its appearance. You can never know the source or the self or whatever you want to call it, non-duality. You can never, or God, if you want, you can never know it directly. You can only know it through its appearances. So in other words, all you can know of it is whatever's happening. That's all you can know of that, it, whatever you want to call it, whatever's happening. But then it gets kind of interesting when you ask yourself, well, what is happening? All that you can say about what's happening is going to be an idea. I ain't going to say, uh, I'm, I'm listening, I'm hearing. Even that is a very basic concept, but nevertheless, it's a concept. There's, there's an imagination there of an I listening to a you. I am listening to you. Yeah. So even that is still a concept, still an idea. If you don't refer to any ideas at all, at all, at all, at all, at all. And I ask you, what's happening now? What is it that's happening? You, you're like an infant. Maybe some perception is there, but you don't know anything. It's an unknowing. It's not a knowing. I'm not teaching you to, to know something. I'm telling you there's nothing to know. I don't know what's happening. I can have an idea about what's happening. I can have a story about what's happening. But who the hell knows what's actually happening? Is anything at all happening? Without referring to any ideas at all. Yeah? Only in idea land, only in story land, something's happening. Yeah, it's Saturday morning or Saturday evening, wherever you are. We came to listen to Daniel, this and that and the other. And later we're going to go have chicken and this. Stories. But what's actually happening here right now is unknown. And I would say nothing is happening. There's an appearance of something happening. There can be a story about what's happening. Yeah? But it's not really real. What it really is, is the non-duality playing as this. Okay. Now, let's see about bridging this absolute and relative. Okay. So it's pretty clear from everything I said that the relative, the appearance, is really the absolute. It's just, it's just God in drag, if you will. There it is. God looks like this. Yeah. So you can't, God can't know what he, she, it is because in God, there is no other. There's no other. There's no self. There's no way to recognize self. So non-duality is, like I said, it's impossible to know it directly. All you can know of it is its expression, its appearance. Yeah. So that's the all, all you can know of God is God is appearing. Or as I like to say, God is knowing himself in this way, in every possible way. God is realizing himself. Yeah. But to know God is to simply not to be fooled by this appearance, thinking that, oh, 
this is really real. Like there are actually a lot of people, there are actually a lot of things. All of that is just knowledge. That's what your knowledge, your knowingness says. I know this guy and I know that guy and I know what happened in my past. And I think I know where the future is going and I know this and I know that. And I know that that's a chair and I know that that's a phone. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. All of that is a dream. Knowing is a dream. And the, the me is interested in that dream of knowing because for the me, knowing is control. By knowing, by having my reference point and knowing what's what and where I stand in relation to it, I feel I'm in control. Now I can control everything. That person's there. Okay. I know that, that, that. Okay. I got the whole thing figured out. I think I know how to, it's like running a football play. I'm going to first run through there. Then I'm going to go through there. Then I'm going to get to my goal. The me always has a goal because now is never good enough. So the goal is always over there and the goal is called satisfaction. I'll get there or fulfillment or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's the me. So it knows where it is. It kind of knows where it's going to go, how it's going to get there. It thinks it does, right? So knowledge is only for control. Only the me is interested in knowledge because the me is interested in control. Yeah. What if we didn't know anything? What if you didn't know anything at all? Then this is just happening, right? And there's just what's happening and there's no one to control it. Yeah. So all there is, is the non-duality expressing itself. And in that absence of anyone to care about controlling or not controlling, there's freedom. It's not your freedom. It's not a freedom you attain. It's the freedom of non-duality. It's, it's God's freedom, life's freedom, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's free. It's expressing itself right now in this moment. Nothing's missing. Nothing's lacking. Nothing needs to be added. The me always wants, but, but okay, okay, this is okay, maybe, but what more? Can I have, what's the additional thing that's going to make me feel complete? There is no additional thing, never going to be. There, this is it. This is it. This is non-duality freely expressing itself as whatever. This moment is full potential, the 100% potential of that, God, on manifest, whatever you want it. There is no more. There is no more. Okay. So, as I said before, there is no need to get rid of duality because duality isn't the case anyway. This is non duality. Appearing is multiplicity, but this is non duality. So, one way you could look at it, you know, everybody has probably heard the analogy of the ocean and the waves. So the ocean would be the, the wholeness, and then the wave would be like an individual. And that metaphor has been used by a million teachers to convey that the wave isn't separate from the ocean because all there is going on there is just water. But the wave thinks that it has its own separate existence, right? And it comes out of the water, it rises, thinks, oh, look at me, I'm alive, and then goes back down, and that's it, and merges back with the whole. But it never was separately alive. Never. That never was real. It was always the water. There was never an eye there. There was always just the ocean, okay? Now, I want to use a little bit of a different metaphor to convey something very similar, and that's the metaphor of the mirror. So if you think of that whatever that is as a mirror you shatter that mirror you get shards infinite shards of a mirror right now you know from previous talks that i've said that the one or that or the unnameable whatever that is the unknowable it can't know itself unless there's a reflection again there's no way to know itself god can't know itself unless there is a second right? So through self-reflection, which is what consciousness is, through its own dream, it, that's what the dream is. It's the self-reflecting upon itself. So it's as though that infinity, whatever it is, had a mirror in front of it, and then all of this came into being. But the mirror is not really a whole mirror. It's a shattered mirror broken into infinite shards. And each one is a shard of the mirror. 
All right, so that means that everyone is the mirror. Like I said, like the waves are the ocean. Every, every shard is the mirror. There is nothing but that. However, this is what we, we, where I said today, I'm going to bridge a bit more about the absolute and the relative. However, each shard has its own experience. Each shard is a perspective of that. Now, what that means is, especially for, for those of you who read my book, you'll understand, I've said that on the individual level, everything that you see outwardly is a reflection of your inward life, if you will, your inward landscape. So your beliefs do create your reality. Create in a way that they just, they just reflect it back to you. So how does that work? You see, that's what I'm explaining to you now. How it works is that if the infinite is having the mirror reflected back to itself, then every shard is having its own seemingly separate reality reflected back to itself. So every shard, depending on whatever is inside it, is going to have its own reality reflected back to it. So that really makes it seem like we are actually real separate individuals. I have my own reality. I have my own perception. I have my own perspective. You don't see what I see, so how could we be the same one? But what we are is the same mirror. We're shards of the same mirror. Yeah, but every shard is reflecting something different, either slightly different or completely different. Okay, but nevertheless, all that there is is that the infinite, the, the unmanifest, the unknowable, the unnameable, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So why am I going into that? Because as I've been saying again and again, you don't need to get rid of duality to reach non-duality. There's no reaching non-duality, right? There's no reaching it. This is it. This is non-duality appearing as this. And duality is not real. This is just the clothes non-duality wears. It looks like this. You want to know what God looks like? There it is, right? So if we don't need to get rid of duality, then what do we need to do? And what are we trying to do anyway? You, if you don't even need to get rid of this, the, the, the sense of whatever, Stephen, Una, Alok, Krishna, you don't need to get rid of that. What would be the point of getting rid of something that is just an appearance? What, what, would you, what would you need to get rid of an appearance? What for? What for? Yeah, it's not like you wake up in the morning and you see that body in the mirror and you go, I'm not that. And then you try to scrape it off the mirror. You, what would be the point? If you know you're not that, then you're not that. That's it. But it is a unique perspective. It's the lens through which the absolute is looking, right? Every shard is the lens which, which, through which the absolute is looking. As we've said in previous talks, it's like the glasses. The absolute is the eyes, and every one of us is like glasses through which it looks. And it sees a different perspective of what? Only of itself. The only thing it can know is itself because there's nothing else, no other. So my point is, in bridging this absolute and relative, is that there is no need to get rid of anything. So then the duality and the individuality become a celebration. They become a celebration of the expression of non-duality. It becomes something beautiful, something gorgeous, in fact, that the non-duality expresses itself as this. Yeah? But you just have to know that what, what you take yourself to be is someone who was born and is going towards death, is someone who came from there and is maybe going over there. That's not real. That's maybe an experience that you may have on, to, for functional reasons. You need to function in society. You know, if I say Lisa, I hope Lisa turns her head, you know, because otherwise she's not very functional. But that, so that's not real. What, what, what is, is just this expressing itself. This is the expression. It looks like this. And if it looks like that, like this, and there is the sense of a, of, of a me here, then that's part of it. There's nothing that, there's no inside and outside to it. There's nothing that you need to get rid of to get to it. 
anything you try to get rid of it it means that you think it's it's a, it's a it's a interruption to the non-duality but it is the non-duality this is it this is how it's playing this is how it's expressing so there's absolutely nothing to get rid of not even a self a separate self So there, there, there just can't be anything wrong. There can't be. It, that's only a judgment of the mind. That's only knowledge. The, the knowledge of good and evil, of right and wrong. That. All in all knowledge, as I said, all knowledge is a dream. It's a dream that the separate self has. That there's two things going on. There's right and wrong. There's back there and where I'm going to over there. That doesn't exist. There is no over there. There is no next thing that's going to fulfill me. There is no completion to be found. There's nothing missing in this very moment. Yeah. That's really the message. If you can hear that there's nothing missing right now, and then all, the, all that's left, if you will, is the non-duality, the unmanifest enjoyment of however freedom freedom of however it appears it's free there's nothing wrong and if you can get that then everything that the little me is built upon crumbles apart because what the little me is built upon it's called something very heavy called guilt i did something wrong and i'm trying to do it right it's always caught up in that game of trying to do it right and trying to avoid doing it wrong. And it thinks it did something wrong in the past because it has the illusion of having made choices and being a doer, right? And the guilt anchors the me in place. Without the guilt, I promise you, you can't have a sense of, like a solidified sense of me. A sense of me can arise here, but it's not so solid, meaning it's not, it's not taken to be real. Once the sense of me is taken to be real, that's the only problem. It's not about getting rid of the me, simply seeing that it's not real. And then if it's there or not there, it doesn't matter. Because when it's there, it's, it's, it's got a functional thing. It's got a functional thing. It's important to know your roles on a functional level. You're a father, you're a mother, you're this, you're that, teacher, whatever. And, and it's important, you know, if you go to a job interview or whatever and they ask you about your skills, you won't say, I have no past, never acquired a skill, I was never born. What are you talking about? And so obviously there has to be some sense of me on for the functional level. Yeah. But it's not real. It's not real. And once it's taken to be real, the whole world is real. Everything is real. And it's no longer merely that appearing as this. That's all that's going on. This is that. If you want to find non-duality, oh, here it is. There it is. Just this. Whatever it looks like now. I don't know what it is. And anyone who claims to know what it is has no clue whatsoever. It's impossible to know what it is. All you can know is an idea, a concept. How can that which is not a concept be known? All you can know is a concept. You make it into a concept, into an idea. So if there's nothing to get rid of, only to see that the self is not real, it's not real. That's why I call it a phantom. phantom it's like a ghost existence. It's not a real existence. Yeah. Then what is there to do? But you see, the problem is for the seeker a lot of times is that even when this level is, is starting to be realized, they're still trying to abide. This stupid, this is the most misunderstood thing. I'm going to abide. Where are you abiding and who is abiding? Where? Where are you trying to go? There is nowhere to go. As I started by saying, there is no second. There is no other. There is no there. Non-duality, no two. This is all there is right now. This is all there is. It never gets more ever. There's, no, there's not going to be another 
And that's what the me wants is another thing that will complete me. This another thing that will make it all, all go away, all the pain. And there is no another. This is it. And what could possibly be wrong with non-duality appearing, let's say, as fear? Who doesn't want the fear? Who says the fear is wrong? Who knows that? Who could know that the fear is wrong? Yeah, and non-duality appearing is pain. This shouldn't be happening. Who says that? Who's separate from what's happening to say that, to know that? How could you know it should be happening? That's the arrogance of the me. I know it should be better than this. <laughs> and that's why it suffers. It always suffers because this is never good enough. It never satisfies. It's never up to its standards, if you will. Yeah. So the guilt, the guilt is what you want to want to be looking at if you're feeling your me to be real, because the guilt is like it's so heavy. It's an anchor that solidifies that sense of me, solidifies it. There's an I here, and I did that thing that I regret five years ago. I really regret that. I regret that that thing happened to me. It happened to me. I regret that I should have made better decisions. I should have done that. Oh, I'm, or, or it goes the other way around where, you know, everybody else is guilty and projects the guilt outward is blame. And they're all stupid. They're all this, they're all that. They made a mistake. If they didn't do that, I'd be better off today. If he wasn't like that, we'd get along just fine. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. All the stories, all the knowledge, which remember what I said about knowledge? Knowledge is only for control. Only the illusory controller gives a shit about knowledge wants to know things so it can control them. Yeah. So all of that story of guilt and blame, all of that is complete BS because there simply is no one. So who did what and to who? If there's only that, that, the self, the nameless expressing itself, then who's really in charge? It's like the dream characters are blaming each other and pointing fingers and hating the past and fearing the future, while really it's they, all they are are characters in its dream. It's up to the dreamer. Is there anything that the dreamer didn't do? The dreamer's in charge of everything. It's not like in charge in a, you know, humans protect, project a controlling kind of in charge, like, a, like, like that is controlling its manifestation but it's not separate from itself to do that. It doesn't leave itself and then tries to control itself. That would be insane. It just it appears as it appears and it's utterly helpless. It can't do anything about the way it appears and it doesn't perceive a need to do anything about the way it appears because it's innocent. It doesn't know, oh, this is a bad appearance. Oh shit, I made a mistake. Wait, let me correct it. You think God operates like that? It just appears as it appears, and it's innocent. That means it knows no guilt. Innocence. It's innocent. This is innocent. The me goes, why should it appear like this, though? It's not fun enough. It's not good enough. Blah, 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 blah. But from the point of view of what you really are, there's never a why. If anything, there's, there's only a why not. Why should it not appear like this? It's perfect. It's perfect. So when this starts sinking in, you start to celebrate. You start to celebrate that there's that, that this is this is already freedom. There's nothing that needs to be done. But while the me again is weighing you down with this heaviness, so we spoke about guilt, but then another way to enlighten, to lighten up from the me. It's never the me that, the me can't really lighten up. The moments where you're very light, it just means that that me energy is, is dissipated. And then it comes back, it comes back like a contraction. Ugh. And life is serious again, and everything's very important, and you fear the outcome. Because the me is always living for the outcome. It can never just enjoy this. It's always about the outcome. It's always about even as it listens, what am I understanding and how is this understanding helping me gain something? I want to I gain something from this. 
But there is no you. There's no you to gain or to lose. There's nothing to gain or to lose, and there's no one to gain or to lose. There's only that. And that is appearing as this, and it's not missing anything. So while the me appears to be heavy, one thing that you can do, yeah, first of all, the first thing I said is forget about the guilt and the blame. All of that, you never did anything. You have to get that really, really deep inside. You never did anything. This dream is a dream that you're not in control of. Yeah, and all of these characters are just being dreamt, being lived. So whose fault is anything? Everybody has to say the next thing. Everybody has to do the next thing. Yeah, there's, there's no control over it. So all your game and guilt and blame is meaningless. And it comes down to that it has to be the way it is. Because if there's no two, how could it be any other way? This is the only way it knows itself right now. And right now, this is the way it only, the only way it knows itself. This is the only way. So it, 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 whatever it is, knows itself in all ways. And it seems to experience it linearly from a human's perspective, right? But what you experience in this moment is the only way it can be. So there can't be any guilt or blame in it. What, what, what happens has to happen, in other words. It doesn't has to have to happen because God decided and was thinking about it and thought, this is important, it needs to happen. It's not like a plotting or a planning. It just can't be any other way. Like I said, that is helpless. It just appears as it appears. It dreams what it dreams. It can't help itself. So the second thing that you can do to make your to to alleviate the heaviness and seriousness of the me is stop making things matter and that is deliberately worded that way because by making things matter you make things matter you make things into matter you solidify the reality everything is so important and it matters you become a real person to whom everything matters to whom everything appears as matter. When nothing matters, that, you're, you're, that means that the me is dissipated. Unless it's still a, a perspective of depression, where nothing matters and therefore I'm depressed. That's still the me using the nothing matters kind of as a, as a what it means to me. What it means to me that nothing matters. Or, or it's depressed about nothing means anything. Then it means to it, it has a very negative meaning to it that nothing means anything. That's still the me using that as a concept. But beyond the concept, when nothing matters at all, really, not as a concept, that just means that there's already freedom. So why would anything matter? Something only matters or means something for the me when it wants to get somewhere. It's only in relation to where the me, where the me thinks it's going, whatever outcome it's going towards. Then something means something in relation to that. It matters. It matters that things go this way because I'm trying to get here. And then it has this argument with life because reality goes one way, but the me has his own ideas of how it should go. Yeah, so it, it matters and it's trying to control it. So if you, if you let it go, nothing really matters. Nothing, but like nothing really matters. Immediately, you become weightless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you understand what I'm saying. It doesn't matter if you don't. It doesn't matter if hunger appears. It doesn't matter if pleasure appears. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the one for whom it would matter is a phantom. It doesn't matter because it's already complete. And so that's, that's the freedom. If it's already complete, then who cares what happens? So... Therefore, those are my mantras, as you know. Who cares? So what? It doesn't matter. If you use those mantras often, the me will, will start dying. Because it's all about, I care. I care about the outcome. I care about the future. It matters. It's important. It's serious. Yeah. 
So, so what about whatever happens? So what? Big deal. Who cares? Doesn't matter. It's light. You let it go. Um, okay. Now, there are, this is not just conceptual. So I, I also said that today I'm going to go into, um, into really, really I want to get to the practicality of what it means, the end of suffering, because we hear that. And what does it actually mean? So one thing I can tell you definitely doesn't mean is the end of pain. It's not the end of pain. Pain still comes and goes. Pain and pleasure. We live in the duality of yin and yang in the apparent duality of yin and yang. So it's always going to move from a more passive time in life or a more relaxed time in life to a more active life time in life or more tense. It's always phases. And in the same way, also pain turns to pleasure, turns to pain, turns to pleasure, turns to pain, turns to pleasure. So that's why that's part of the, the, the idiocy of hoping to get to some state that is clean and free of everything that's unwanted. It's all the me's doing all the time. I've got to get this, and then this good thing that I perceive, and then I, I'm going to hold on to it and avoid everything that's bad. Yeah. So never going to happen. The, the wheel keeps turning. But the one who minds the turning wheel, the one who makes it matter, the one who cares, the one who can't say so what and takes it seriously and makes it important, that one's going to suffer from the turning wheel. The one who doesn't care, doesn't make it important, is already free. That's why you can do that. That's why you cannot care. Because it doesn't matter. Because that, that, that which knows in you that it doesn't matter is what you really are. It knows. It doesn't matter. All is well anyway. And nothing that happens can ever break this all is well. There is nothing in the dream that can make what you are incomplete. Yeah. So... This literally, so it's kind of like Stephen said last time when we, when we went to that place of irreverence, it doesn't matter. He said the brain fog's gone. So that's a practical application of this in the sense that there's actual things that make suffering go away. Brain fog is, is, a, very, is a state that's very difficult to function in, right? So the, 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 the alleviation of brain fog is one of the benefits of of being true to what you really are yeah being what you really are really and not lying about it that's all that is yeah so um so so that's uh one thing and in general we're talking about being in a state that this is a real practical benefit in a state that's just more in alignment because you see there is there's what's been referred to as the, the Tao or the Tao, you may have heard of it. And that means that life has its own flow. But while you have the sense of a me here that's trying to have its own way, you resist the Tao. You resist life's way. And when you do that, there's going to be more illnesses. And there's just going to be a lot more misery, frustration, because you're if the, if the river of life is turning left and you're like, no, I want this to turn right, Who's going to win that argument? Believe me, you're going to always lose against life. So it's better to read where the river's going. That's what you have intuition for or the ability to sense or feel. Feel what, where's, what's life doing right now? Is it asking of me to, let's say, have been really active in the past period? Check in within yourself. Do I still need to be active? Because a lot of times life wants you to just be in the receiving side. Hey, can you calm fuck down and receive, relax? In our society, that's not really something that anybody is good at because we are conditioned that you need to give. Only giving is good. Receiving is selfish. And obviously, we're the most idiotic society in the face of the multiverse because if you don't receive, how can you give? So everybody's depleted, but all it's about is continuously producing. You have to produce, 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 produce. But hey, you know what? You're actually, th there's a movement. That's the Tao. There's a movement. And that movement needs you at times to do more. And it needs you at times to do nothing or less and just receive. And that's because there's things that you can't do. That 
you got to do your part, but then there's this, there's the universe's part, which is there's things that you can't know how they will happen and you can't know when they will happen. That's the universe's job. So you do what you can do. You push it forth up until the point that you can, and then you give it away and you say, Hey, universe, it's your turn. Take it away. I'm, I'm going to relax and receive right now. So you take care of how this is going to unfold and when. I don't know. So that's just an example of, see, when you're more in alignment by being at ease, by not letting things matter so much, by not being motivated out of guilt, then everything will flow and manifest for you in a much easier, honestly, in an effortless way. It's not the goal. This is not the goal of this teaching. It's, it's a practical byproduct of what we're talking about is how is suffering eliminated? I'm trying to tell you in a practical way what happens to suffering. So see, most of what we do, we do out of guilt. It's never enough. Guilt is always, there's something that's not quite enough. That's, that's wrong. And I need to prove myself. By, by trying to make it right, by doing more, by getting somewhere. So everybody's doing out of this need to prove themselves. And most of the human's action as, and societies, the collective, most of it is unnecessary. And unnecessary action creates unwanted results. It, 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 what we've done as a society is we've trapped ourselves in a cage that now we're trying to get out. That cage is the rat race. We're always running. We can't stop it. Now we can't stop it. You stop for a moment, look what happened to the stock market. You, you can't stop. You have to keep going. You have to keep running all the time. And what got us into this running place in the first place is, okay, maybe there was a bit of overexcitement at some point. Things went well and people got overexcited and didn't know when to quit. But the main thing was the guilt. I, I'm not good enough. I, I need to get people's approval, so I need to keep proving myself. So one thing, when you let go of the outcome, a whole load of suffering goes away, which is the suffering caused by taking unnecessary action. Action that is out of alignment. Action that is coming from an idea that says, I think this is a good idea. I should do that. Let's keep on doing. Let's keep on doing stuff. I, I need to do more so that I can feel good about myself because if I stop doing now, I, I'll feel like I just, I, I don't deserve to rest. I don't deserve to just or whatever yeah i keep i need to keep doing and then the ideas that come from that are again the ideas that i talked about last week which are empty promises yeah do this that'll help do that that'll help no it won't help it's an empty promise it's a bad idea do what you need to do just what you need to do and you'll find that like an animal most of your time is, ends up being free yeah but for the ego that's really really hard for the me because one thing that the, that the me can't take is that all is well. It thinks that it wants that. I want everything to just be okay. But the reason it can't take it is because it, where's the drama in that? If everything's just okay, what's going to happen in my story? I, how, how is drama going to be? You know, I need to create some drama because it doesn't recognize itself, the me, the ego, without drama. It doesn't recognize itself. So as long as it can do something to be a victim or to create drama or trauma, it will just to recognize itself. Because otherwise it's like death for the me. No me. I don't know. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know what I am anymore. I don't even know what's happening. That absolute lack of knowledge of knowing for the me is unbearable. So it would rather go to other teachings where they tell it, no, you can still live on as awareness. Just be awareness. Just be whatever you are, your consciousness. They define for it what it is. And then the sense of me feels, oh, okay, this is where I can stay. Yeah, great. I, I live on this way. But if there's no knowledge at all, everything's taken away. You don't know what's happening and you don't know what you are. It's like deep, deep sleep. It's like deep, deep sleep. Nothing's happening. Nothing's going anywhere. Nothing is known. Yeah, And for the me, that's like non-being. And that's it's a complete horrible thing because the me defines being alive as I'm here, me, experiencing things, 
that's being alive. What are you talking about? Me experiencing stuff. That's, that's being alive. Yeah. But I tell you, there is no you as a real experiencer. There is no real experiencer whatsoever. There's only that appearing as this. The, this is it. Even, even when I say that in this, that's almost sounds like two. It's not that in this is the, this is it. This is it. Yeah. So without the me, all that you could possibly say is like I said, all there is is what's happening. Or you could just say it is as it is. And that means that there's no, uh, There's no idea about it. So if, if there's pain, then it is as it is. That's what is. But there is no, there shouldn't be the pain, or the pain is somehow making this not okay. Yeah. So another big thing that the me can do to alleviate, that you, that you can do to alleviate the me, let's put it that way, is the whole bullshit of fitting in. Part of how you create and construct your prison is that you try to be like whatever you're told you should be, fitting in. Now, one of the best quotes ever to talk about this was Jiddu Krishnamurti when he said, um, it is no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. It is no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Now, if you're unsure whether the society is sick, well, let me tell you, it's very sick because it's a society that's again, as, as I said, it's built on guilt. And last time we kind of talked about how when you're uh, gaining your, your identity, you, uh, the first things you know are guilt and love. The love of, the, of your parents or the sense of guilt. You know, the love is when your parents approve of you and then the sense of guilt is when they don't. And then you feel like you're wrong. You did something wrong. And then your whole life you spend in that, trying to get it right and trying to avoid the wrong, trying to avoid the guilt, trying to get the love, the whole thing. And what people would do for love is, or it's not real love though. It's just approval. It's just a sense of to be, to feel that you're okay through others. Cause that's how it worked with your parents. And then you keep that going all your life. And you're trying to be okay through others. So all that people do is try to get other people to react positively to them to think positively about them. And what that makes them do is instead of respond from what's real inside of them, instead of asking themselves, what's true for me? What's my truth? They just do whatever they think they need to do for the other to like them or approve of them so that they can get that feeling of being loved. Yeah? And that's completely distorted. It distorts who you, your unique expression, your unique shard of the mirror completely distorts it because you're not in touch with yourself then at all. And so we have a society where nobody's in touch with themselves at all. So the person who's meant to be a poet goes and becomes a dentist. Yeah. And the person who doesn't love something, instead of feeling what they actually like, even when it comes to music or partners or this or that, they don't even know what they, what, what's for them, what's relevant for them and what isn't. They just know what the commercial's saying, what their friends saying, what society says. And they're just trying to fit into that. And I say fitting in is, 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 is extremely painful because it's contorting your natural self into very strange yoga poses just so you could fit in and get some approval that there's absolutely no value. Because what are you gonna do with the approval of others? Just gonna put it in a certificate and put it on the wall? Oh, Mary approves of me. Good. Everybody look, we got the certificate. She approves. Who gives up? You know, nobody cares. Who cares? Who needs anybody's approval? And I tell you, if you just do what's real for you, and I go like this because this is alignment. Again, the, 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 the simplicity is that waking up puts you in alignment and being in alignment saves you a lot of suffering in a practical way. So when you're being real in, with yourself and you're asking, what's true for me? What do I really feel to do here? Not what would make others uh, approve of me or whatever. Who should I be according to others? But what's really, who's, who am I right now for real in relation to this topic? 
If you do that, you save yourself all the trouble of, of the effort and the exhaustion that comes from trying to be someone that you're not. Trying to like music that you don't, trying to go to events that you don't give a shit about, trying to fit in this and that and the other, trying to hang out with friends that you don't really like, trying to, 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 trying. It's always trying. And in just being what's real with you without the fear of losing something, just being real, there's no trying. There's just tuning in what's real for me and doing that. And that's it. And if it means that another person doesn't want to hang out with you because that's how you are, then thank you. You saved me the trouble of going through months and months of having to try to please you and try to fit in with you and this and that and the other. Just for what? Just to realize that I'd get tired of it and I don't really want to be your friend. <laughs> but then the ones who are really for you and really relevant for you in life, then they come to you. So you get what's relevant for you by being real with yourself. But when you're not real with yourself, you get the career that's not relevant for you. You get the friends that are not relevant. Everything is not relevant. It's not your life. You're living a life of someone who you're trying to be. It's not you. It's not your life. Yeah? So the fitting in part, if you can, if you can quit that, stop contorting yourself, um, you'll save yourself a ton of trouble. So you don't even want to fit in. Why would you want to fit into a society that's really miserable? The fact that commercials and, new, and things on TV and Instagram and whatever looks happy, that doesn't mean it is happy. That just probably means it's American. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all fake. It's fake. Fake news on social media. It's fake. It's fake. So, you know, Americans only show each other their smiles, their happiness. They never show what's really going on. So anyway, don't be fooled by what it looks like. People sell you that having this and that and the other makes you happy. It doesn't. And who wants to fit into this society who's always trying to chase something for happiness? As I've told you a million times, it's only the misery that chases happiness anyway. So it's better not to fit in. You'll feel relieved if you quit that game. Very relieved. And, and especially if you realize that, really, you don't want to fit in. That This was sold to you, that this is something you need to do. But if you see that fitting in makes you miserable, if you see that it's poison, you'll stop. You'll stop trying to. And then you'll finally be the unique shard of the infinite that you are. And that will be ease for you. So with that also, a lot of the guilt will go away because the guilt is a lot of times a result of trying to fit in, trying to play the game that's not your game. The game that whatever game your, your immediate society is playing or whatever game society is playing, you're, that you're actually not genuinely interested in, but you feel that you have to play the game. And then you fail in that game and then you feel guilty. You feel that you're not good enough. You feel that you did something wrong. And there's always a competition of there's somebody who's doing it better than you out there. Yeah. But if you quit the game, then, then that won't be. Who cares? Who cares and who needs to be good at a game that, that leads nowhere? So forget it. Um, so there's a, there's a saying in Hebrew. It's a very beautiful saying. It says, a clever man can get himself out of situations that a wise man does not enter. Who do you want to be, the clever man or the wise man? So everybody in society is clever, which is stupid to me because, okay, you get yourself into these awful situations and you spend your whole life trying to get out of these situations. You follow these bad ideas that are empty promises. And it could be... It could be going on a vacation with, with friends and, and then seeing like that was the worst thing. You just want to go home. It's the worst. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but it's, it's something that you did because your friends wanted to. It's not because you really, that was real for you. Like that was an alignment for you. It wasn't an alignment. For you, right. So I'm saying, I'm just saying it could be something good, something that appears like good to all eyes, but it's not actually right or real for you. So you have to always not just accept everybody's definition of what's good, but tune in and see what's real. 
is this really for me? Is this relevant for me, right? So the wise man doesn't even enter the situation that's gonna make him suffer. So it's very practical, this end of suffering, just by being real with yourself and just by knowing that this doesn't need to complete itself. You don't need to do stuff to complete yourself. Yeah? Then you, you, there's so much irrelevant stuff and unnecessary action that falls away. And all that irrelevant stuff and unnecessary action is what has actually been causing you suffering. Of course, it comes from the psychological level, yeah, where you're believing all these ideas that are bad ideas, that are not real for you. You're not attuned with yourself. And they're coming from the me saying, do that, go on that vacation with those guys, do this, do that, buy that, go there, because that will complete you. When all of that psychological structure is gone, there are actual changes to the actions you take and how you live. You don't take actions that are not necessary, which cause unnecessary suffering. Yeah? So you don't get yourself into the situations that a clever man does and then has to dig his way out, which is stupidity. Yeah? So, so those are the main things to alleviate the heaviness of the me, yeah? Realize you don't need anything to complete you. There's no need. So there's no need for an outcome. So you stop chasing these stupid ideas of, wait, if I, had, if I just do that, maybe, then maybe, maybe then I'll feel better. I'll be complete. No, if you don't feel good, just don't feel good. If that's how this is appearing, as not feeling good, just don't feel good. So what? That's the mantra. You have to apply it not just when it's whatever, all the time. So what? So it's not a great feeling right now, but who cares? And, and why would one care? Why? What's wrong with not everything feeling great in the body? What's wrong with that? Why should everything feel great in the body? That's how this is appearing. No one's being affected by it because there is no one. Yeah. Remember, when I say you as a separate individual, I'm talking about an appearance, not a reality. It's, it's, it's a dream. And you need that, as I said, for functional purposes, but it's, don't, don't think it's real. Nothing's real. So, in, so the truth is nothing's happening at all. That which is in deep, deep sleep is, is always. Everything else is just an appearance. It's a dream. Yeah. Uh, so did I talk about everything I said I would talk about today? <laughs> mm. It was really good, Daniel. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. Well, you know what? If there's more that I wanted to talk about, it'll probably come about through questions. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, doesn't have to be a question or anything you just want to express. The truth is there's absolutely no need to say anything. It's not, again, like I, told, like I tell you, there's no, I didn't wake up this morning uh, thinking that this is important to convey. That there's stuff that needs to be said. Nothing needs to be done at all whatsoever, done or said, but it still happens. And that's the fun. That's the fun. It's not because nothing needs to be happened. I don't need anything. I'm just abiding in the state. Mm. And then you're closed. You're absolutely closed. So that's, that's the wrong awakening, if you will, where you're using that as a push away. No, nothing's real. So then, you know, people come up to you and they call you Daniel and you go, there's no Daniel here. There's no Daniel. Nope. You know, you deny everything. You don't embrace life at all. You don't enjoy it because you think that duality is somehow real and it's bothering the non-duality, but it isn't. It's the non-duality expressing as duality. So in that there's, there's absolute freedom. There's nothing that can possibly get in the way of that. There's nothing that happens that isn't that. There's absolutely no separation. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I've been here. Krishna, I knew you were going to ask a question. Yes. Can you can you uh, talk louder or something? I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, the third point. Eh, okay, I'll turn up my volume. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was addressing me, and I wanted just a little more clarification on that. On what? So, uh, uh, the third point about the uh, the people who don't uh, try to fit in. Yeah. So, uh, how to uh, exactly know, like, uh, if you want to change now, like, what is your uh, real nature? Like, what do you want to do? Oh, in on the individual level. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, just so we're clear about this, this that's why questions are good because they help clarify stuff. The individual is the whole. The shard mm -hmm. of the mirror is not something separate or different. It's the mirror, mm -hmm. right? So we understand, just so we're clear, the individual isn't uh, a separate yeah. reality, you understand? It's just the whole looking through a unique perspective, okay? Um, so your question is, what, what's your question? about how to know that the re what's real so thing is like it's real yeah yeah because i have been like fitting into the society as far as i know uh -huh. and i have and i i really don't know like uh, what's my nature is so how to recognize it now i wouldn't call it nature it's just it's just your uniqueness the uniqueness of me yeah, nature applies to that that's your nature your nature is the mirror yeah. itself is that yeah that's what you really are so but you as a unique expression yeah so you have yeah. certain things that are meant for you right like i can't yeah. i couldn't become, if i were to become an engineer i would have hated my life because yeah. it's not for yeah. me yeah yeah i do think so <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's not for somebody else there it, first of all understand there is no hierarchy so being um, uh, doing what i do or being a plumber is the same exact same no, yeah that's true but yeah now i I have no how to change because I have fit into into the society, and I think it's not so good for me anyhow. Anyhow. So perfect. So when you say you fit into the society, what what do you mean? Give me something practical. Like, like I'm I'm not meant to be an engineer as far as I know. Like uh, I uh, my mind doesn't think my mind doesn't think in that way. How how does your mind think? It's more natural. Like uh, I can recognize. Might be I might I might have been a psychologist or something in that way, but uh, now that's that's not the career path I can choose because my mom was already like uh, thirty or something and I have to there are many more things. So so how did be, you come how did you come to this right now? How did you see that isn't really for me, but that might be because, actually for me. Yeah. Because I was struggling in my life and I, the reason I think is because I was fitting me. And I try to push myself without any logic. Yeah, yeah. So you see, you answered yourself. This is the type, this is how you come to it. You see that whatever you're doing, there is a, it's not that it should be effortless in the sense that, you know, when you're learning a new trade or doing something new, or even if you're if just wanting as a hobby to learn guitar or play the drums or whatever, there's gonna be the effort of learning that's not, when I talk about effortlessness, I don't mean just watching TV, you know? So just so you understand, there, there can be effort, right? Mm -hmm. But see, the way you came to that understanding, that's the way you come to it. It has to come from experience. So you try to be something you're not. You see that that leads to misery and it's exhausting. And then you, you, that makes you turn inwards and ask yourself, wait, what is right for me? For me, what do I really think about this and that? What do I really want? And that can be with everything. So, you know, I mean, if your friends say that yeah. this genre of music is the best and you just liked it to fit in, then, then you weren't really asking yourself, do I actually really like it? What do I think about it? So what we're talking about is really think for yourself, which is radical. It's sad to say it's a radical thing in our society because this is a herd it's mentality. a street society. Yeah, it's a herd mentality. Exactly. Yeah. So what we're all, the only thing to be real with yourself is to think for yourself and to feel into yourself. What is correct? What would I be good at? Maybe I'd be good as a psychologist. And then even if you're wrong and it ends up that you're being good as a life coach, 
then whatever. But you, you start going in that direction that is right for you. And then you learn from your experience. So you're saying just stop. Just what? So you just, just stop. Absolutely, without the fear of, of getting it wrong or making a mistake. Because if you have the fear of getting it wrong or making a mistake, you are paralyzed. You don't move. But one of my favorite quotes regarding that is actually it comes from John Bon Jovi, who said, success is falling nine times and getting up 10. And so people who are finding what's really their thing to do in life, which is really your passion tells you that. Your, whatever is, feels right, yeah? then they're willing to go and, and fall and fail because that's just the, that's the only way to, to get to your destination in that sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfectionists don't even start. Yeah. That's, that's what's sad about them. Yeah. 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 But you see, you asked about the difference between a calling and an empty promise. Because last week, I kind of ended, ended with that that because last week was a lot about the empty promises, which is just the ideas of the mind that say that appeal to the hope. Yeah. The, the, the me, all that the me is, is hope. It's hoping for salvation in the next thing. Yeah. So the ideas of the mind always say, Hey, do that. That'll, that I promise you, that'll give you what you're looking for. And it's an empty promise because it never does. But so I said, there's that and there's what your calling is. So what we're talking about you and I right now, that's, that's, how you find your calling is what really feels right. It's not about some, some idea of like makes you glass eyed and think like, Oh yeah, when that fantasy is fulfilled, I'll be so happy. I think it's regardless of outcome. It's regardless of outcome. It's just what, it's kind of like just what you have to do. Like a person who has to work with his hands, he, he has to, it's almost like he has to either work at a farm or work with clay or work. He has to, that's his inclination. You know, so. Hi, Daniel. Hey. Hi. So I had a question. Um, uh, so I, I recently started reading your articles and uh, started watching videos um, and kind of went through a small cycle where, a sm uh, like a small depression cycle where I was feeling hopelessness of there's no point, as you mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it kind of jived well with me when you said that even that is still the me. We're just trying to feel that there is nothing for me. <laughs> yep. So, uh, just, just, just wanted to call that out. Beautiful. Okay. So, and, and now, um, you see, now by exposing that, is, there, is, it, is it still depressing? It is. Um, I feel a little bit of a freedom from that depression now because I'm not feeling that there is no point, but it, it is just what it is. And it has just has to be what it is. Like there's yes. no doing about it, but yeah, it's just happening. It's no doing. Right. So the me is like a reference point that anything that is said, it makes it about itself. And, it, and the, when I say there's no point, it's, I'm not telling that to the me. It's just, it's just talking to the air. There's no point. It's not, it doesn't need to be taken by a reference point, point and owned. Oh, there's no point for me. No, I'm just saying there's no point. You know, it's freedom. This doesn't need a point. That's the beauty of it. it doesn't need a point to be. It just is. Yeah. Because you see, a lot of times non-dual teachers, they'll completely exclude the uh, individual. But I say that causes a lot of the, of the suffering. Because the seeker is then just trying to be that, whatever that is and ignores what's happening in his or her life. And it's horrible. It's horrible. You need to listen to yourself. But then these teachers will just say, but there's no self to listen to. So you're, you, you get this mind fuck of, okay? And then it ends up just being incredible suppression. You don't actually, you don't actually live the uniqueness that you are. So that's why I said that whole thing about the shard of the mirror. By being an individual, you're still the whole. Yeah. So, I mean, to yeah. try to get rid of the individual in reality, I, I know, all the, you know, all the teachers say that there's no individual and all that. It's not accurate quite 
because there that whatever that is still experiences itself through perspective it can't experience itself if it doesn't have a particular point of view and that's what the individual is it's just the lens through which it looks right? So actually, I just thought of a question. Um, so you uh, keep saying that there's no way to directly know the non-duality. It's, uh, it's just through this appearance of duality. All you can know is the appearance. Right. So, uh, so does that mean that there's basically no difference in experience between like, my experience and your experience? Is there no difference at all? Or because in both cases it's just duality appearing, and uh, both cases it's, it's what it's duality appearing in both experiences, right? So, so that means that there's no difference between a, uh, it's a, non duality appearing, not duality, it's non duality appearing as duality, right? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, non duality appearing as duality, so it's, it's the same in both. So so is there no difference at all? Appearance is difference. The appearance, only the appearance is different. So, the, it, but you see, that's, that's what, it's exactly the point I'm saying is that still what, 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 what you are and what I am, for lack of a better way of saying it, yeah, that's the unmanifest whatever. It's not even that it's the same. There aren't two of it to be the same. There's only that. What's different is that it, you see that, that it knows itself through differences. And what are the differences? Ashwin is one perspective. Daniel is another perspective. What you see in front of your eyes, which are really the eyes of the self, what you see in front of your eyes is different than what I see in front of my eyes. So that's, that's the point. Every shard has a different re reflection. So it's like the example I used to give where uh, it said, you know, take a paper bag, put a bunch of holes in it, right? Shut the lights off in the room and put a flashlight in the paper bag. There will be one light shining out of many holes, right? The yeah. one light shining out of many holes. Unbelievable how much noise my neighbors are making right now. Perfect. So one light shining out of many holes and... Um, one of those holes is called Daniel and the other one is called Ashwin and there's infinite holes like that, right? So every, every, every hole is going to see a different reality, but really it's just one reality, the light itself appearing as these different perspectives. Yeah, I meant to ask in the sense that uh, like, uh, in, uh, like in relation to the uh, misidentification, is, is there any difference? Uh -huh. So some holes, like the, the experiences are different everywhere, but like some people have misidentifications, but some don't have it. Mm -hmm. So is that the only difference between, between an unenlightened and an enlightened one? Or that's the what I'm difference, The difference is in the, is in the, uh, the, 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 there's a structure, like a psychological structure that, has a physical real energetic physical component to it it's either there or it isn't so that that what what we refer to as awakened or enlightened it's it's absent and what we refer to as not awakened or enlightened it's present and that psychological structure is a structure i talk about every time about the need to gain something and the fear of loss it's all it's stuck in that duality of hoping for an outcome and hoping for release in the future or whatever it's 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 the movement of dissatisfaction seeking satisfaction that's what the meat is it's very heavy it's built on guilt yeah so all the guilt it's motivated by that guilt and that move, moves it into unnecessary action um because it's always trying to prove it's it's it, it is enough it's trying to get to a place where it can finally say hey look i am enough i'm rich i'm famous everybody loves me and look i'm enough or I've reached that level of meditation. So look, I'm enough. It's all bullshit. And it's all based on the me. So that whole psychological structure isn't there. And when it falls away, um, the actions are different. 
So the, the energetic component of it releases from the body, if you will. So there is literally, like I said, less brain fog, a, more of a lightness. Uh, and even if the body isn't feeling good, there's still, there's still a lightness about it. It's, it's not important. It's not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Daniel, if we have time, I can ask one question. Yeah, we have time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, I was referring to the grace that we talked about, um, that uh, like nothing really matters whether I understand this, these words coming out of you or uh, how my brain actually understands what you're saying. Uh, can you talk a little bit more on that? Because I feel that after listening to a lot of this, uh, there is no, no really effort that I can make. Uh, to make any kind of change or you know make enlightenment happen as such so so what 's there then like what 's left my my view of that is there is just grace, but if you can clarify a little more so yeah it get it, it can get a bit tricky, but i 'll try to make it simple so um it 's true that there is nothing you can do. And yet, I, there, it's always in a paradox. And yet, there, there, if you still experience that you yourself as a doer, you're going to try to do something. And that's the only reason why I give instructions of what it is you can do. And like I said, release the guilt, release the fitting in, release the, the, the thing that it matters, that things matter. Absolutely release all of that. So the mantras, so what, doesn't matter, who cares, right? So that's what you can do. You can do that. And if you feel yourself as a doer, and if you know you're still going to try to do something, do that 100%. And does it help? I think it helps. Now, I know there are absolute teachings that say nothing can possibly help because there's no one to be helped and blah, blah, blah. And probably I've said that too. Um, but, but it's always in a paradox. So I, I, I would put myself, I'm not one of those teachers who just says, look, there's nothing you can do. And I just, I just say that all the time on repeat. And I'm not one of those teachers who gives you a prescription of what to do and just does that. I'm kind of both. So I, I go from here to there and back. Yeah. Um, so like I said, if you're still feeling yourself as a doer, do those things. Um, now, the, the, the trick behind it is that really the grace is that while you think you're doing it, it's really the, the self is doing it so the self is waking up to itself and it's a process that it has destined it's destined and it's so it's it's really behind it and then when the me falls away suddenly there's the seeing that how how funny it is that you thought you did it and it really is seen as something that just happened and couldn't have happened any other way yeah. And so you asking this question now and you getting this answer now and you coming to this meeting now, and it's all not something that you're really deciding as a separate self. It's the self is deciding that that's the way it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, there's this fleeting feeling sometimes that it's just happening and I'm not doing it. But then there are, as you said, uh, times for filing taxes and then you're again. <laughs> right. Right. So, uh, and, and what, what's important about this is remember that, that whatever way this appears, if it appears as a feeling of non-doership or of doership, it's still that appearing as this. It's, it's still it. So, cause you see, otherwise we get into this tricky thing of, I need to get rid of the sense of doership and who tries to get rid of the sense of doership? The doer. <laughs> right so there's no need to get rid of anything just recognize oh this is how the non-duality is appearing right now and that in a way automatically just that very recognition shows you that even the sense of doership is not something that you're doing or not doing it just appears the non-duality is appearing as a sense of doership yeah yeah thank you sure Hi, Daniel. Uh, the, the analogy of uh, shattered mirrors, uh, can you say a little bit more about that? The analogy of the shattered mirror? Yeah. yeah. Uh, especially compared with the, the wave and the ocean? Yeah. 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 So both analogies are, sh are showing that there's only <laughs> one or more accurately not two. Yeah. 
So the waves are, and the ocean are both the water, but the wave takes itself to be a separate existence, separate from the ocean. The shards and the mirror are both mirror. Yeah, so just like, just like the waves in the ocean are both water, the shards and the mirror are both glass. So the shard isn't different from the mirror. Yeah, so the moment that the shard thinks I was born, it's as though it thinks it, it became a separate existence. It became its own individual existence, but there was no one ever born. The mirror always is. You could say always was, always is, always will be, but it's really just is because there is no was or will be. There's just is. It's only this moment. So the mirror always is, and the shard is just, uh, it's just a particular perspective of the mirror. So another way to understand the shard is, again, when I said that the example about the paper bag, and you put the flashlight in, you put holes in the bag, you shut the lights, the light will shine out of every hole, right? So every hole is like a shard. It's, it's the light is coming out of, of that. That's a perspective, but it's really just one light. So we're saying one mirror, but it's like infinite shards, infinite ways it experiences itself. This right now is one way it experiences itself, right? Another way it would experience itself is sadly the Holocaust. Another way it would experience itself is some beautiful celebration somewhere. You know, another way it experiences itself is a, is a cockroach. Another way, to, all, every infinite ways, and every one of those is a, is like a shard. And what's where it gets interesting? Why I use that analogy today is because it is true, and you know this. This is actually very related to Byron Katie type of work. Is that the beliefs that are in the mind of an individual, the beliefs will cause them to feel certain emotions, which will cause them to take certain actions. So, you know, if, if guilt is the pr predominant belief in someone's head, that's going to cause a lot of grief and then it's going to cause them to take certain actions. And so what we're looking at is how could that be if there is no individual then how could we possibly say that there's still an individual creating his reality? So again, when we say creating the reality, first thing to understand is not like creating by, by volition. It just means that whatever beliefs are in the mind are automatically creating in the sense that, that, that the reality is reflecting the beliefs. The beliefs manifest themselves. So if you're having, let's say, terrible relationships the relationships are reflecting to the shard it's a reflection it's reflecting what you're believing that's making that relationship so horrible or that where it's reflecting to you why you're staying in a horrible relationship for example if, if someone has a belief that their worthiness is on the floor like they're not worth anything they don't deserve any good then they might stay in an abusive relationship right so that's a, that's the, the reality is a reflection of what's happening with the beliefs. So what I'm saying is that how does that happen? We say there is no individual. There are no many realities. There's just the unnameable. That's all that's happening. But the unnameable experiences and expresses itself through pieces and parts, shards. So every shard appears to have its own separate reality. But really what every shard is, is the mirror. So you could say in the same way, Every wave seems to have its own separate reality, but really what is, is just the water. Yeah. But that's how it experiences itself. And it's part of what's so beautiful and gorgeous about it is that it can, it can experience itself in such, there's no word for it, how beautiful it is, but diversity. It experiences itself in this diversity and it can, you know, and that's, that's the beauty is that a lot of people, totally mistaken when they think that oneness it needs to be the the end of diversity that's communism that's uniformity that's conformity right everybody be the same and so everybody is trying to it's like it's not the energy of freedom it's the energy of contraction of like we have to hold everything in place and we all have to be the same and spiritual seekers do do that to themselves when they try to be in a state that experiences no differences 
and oh, nothing's, no, I, I'm not feeling any change. There's no change. There's no difference. There's no, nothing's moving. And they're, they're like stiff about it. But when you know that the movements and the change and the differences are that which doesn't change and is never different and never moves, when you know that it's the same thing, then there's no more the game of trying to abide somewhere, trying to go somewhere, right? Or trying to avoid feeling that you're an individual or that, or, or having a conflict of the non-duality teachings with the creating reality teachings. You just understand it's all one thing. It's all one thing. The mirror is experiencing itself in parts, and each part appears to have its own unique reality. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, make a lot of sense. And especially, I like what you said that there's no way you can experience non duality. Uh, mm -hmm. The only way you experience that is through the duality as a non duality appearance. Right. So, so that's why. I think uh, when when the practice like uh, I'm the space, but it is not a, like space, empty space. The space when you see the space, the space at the moment you see the space. The space already filled with uh, everything. Yeah. So that's the appearance already. But the space, the space is also an experience. It's known. And what what that which is the non-duality, it cannot be known. It's unknowable. So whatever you, is known, you, think that you can experience a space. So space okay. is an experience. Space is an experience. Yeah, absolutely. Like I can't really decide. I give the phrase like a noun as a space, but I can't really describe what it is. What? So when you're talking about space, are you t using the Douglas Harding kind of? Right. Space? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's an experience. It's an experience of myself as formless or as awareness or as space for everything it's still an experience hmm. so what is it it's known by you it's known by you and it's even named by you you see you still know it what well, i'm okay. saying that 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 the absolute in a way you could say the absolute knows everything but it itself cannot be known if you can still know it and experience it because Here's why it's an experience, because you have the experience of, let's say, not being space, thinking your form, right? But then you have the experience of being space and it shifts something, something opens up or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so you're thinking, you're, you're saying the open up as a space, right? Open up, that's why you said the space that can be experienced, because of you, sometimes you feel like a spacious kind of a... I mean, if you can see the space and see it as something that contains forms it's a, it's still an experience of a space it's but a, i feel like i can't see space i can see things in in, in somewhere but I, the, the, the somewhere has a, if i gave a name i call space but i right, but you're still defining yourself as space there's still there's still a knowing a definition of self in that so okay. it's like a sub even though you don't know the result but you subtract the certain things out then you you know so you still yes anything that you can know or name is not it so that's neti neti not this not that that's the only teaching that really works um but yeah space is still known it's still experienced it's still because the headless way for example it was shown to you and mm -hmm. then you had an experience yeah but the, the, is that the also part of a nati nati the the not a not a space, not a... Uh, yes, out, oh, 100%. Yeah, and especially, especially the subtle levels that are space and awareness and all that stuff, you have to neti neti that 100%. It's not that. Not space, not awareness. Uh, as I said, those are still positions for the me to live on. Now it stops living as a form and it mm -hmm. thinks it becomes enlightened by living as a non-form, but it's still in the duality. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not a form. Look at me. Um, I've realized it. But there, there's still a realizer in that. There's still an experiencer in that. There's still someone who got somewhere, mm -hmm. some knows something. Yeah. So the nati nati is a prior the space. Yeah. The neti neti. When you neti neti everything, it leaves you nowhere. That's that. And leave you with any place to land. Yeah. 
And that's why I compare it to deep, deep sleep, because deep, deep sleep, there's no knower of anything, not even space, not even some space who contains forms or anything. Mm -hmm. well, when, when I heard of deep, deep space, I just feel like that, that seems I'm not related to it. I can't relate to it. The space you can relate to? No, no, no. Space, space, like you said, that there sometimes feels like that's spacious. Uh, but uh, say the deep, deep sleep, it, it feels like that there's is not not this individual, not this union can be. There's really. no one to in deep, deep sleep. There's no one to be space. Right. There's no one to be space, and so in the so-called waking state, uh, all maybe the feeling of space may appear, but there is no identification that says that I am that. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's just an appearance of what I am. And that's all I can ever know is the appearance of what I am, even space, even awareness, whatever. It's just appearances of what I am. They're not what I am. Yeah. And I, I, I'm hesitant today to say what you are, what I am, that the, the use of the word I and you because again, that's something that the that the separate self can capitalize on, makes it like thinks it's something that it's gonna get. So I, sometimes it's better to just call it it. It mm -hmm. appears yeah. as this. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hey Daniel. Yes. Hey, hi. Uh, so I have a question and I was trying to figure out what exactly is collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, really, it's a concept like everything else. It's just a concept. But it's a way to say, um, if you were to look at Earth from above and kind of try to measure what kind of, what kind of ideas, what kind of psychology, what kind of beliefs um, dominate the humans on this planet, that would be their collective consciousness. And the beliefs that dominate humans are, are on this planet are guilt beliefs, um, uh, insecurity, always trying to prove that they're okay, that they're enough, always looking for love because they think love is lost. It's kind of a sad planet to look at from above. Yeah. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. So so is there a way to? Um... I know you were talking about how thoughts basically manifest, you know, into the reality so so in that sense each each location uh, you know each location as uh, you know, wait, 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 wait. You're, you're totally cut location, off you totally sorry, cut off location you totally before, before you continue i'll just clarify something it's not that thoughts manifest into the reality it's beliefs so the difference is a thought is uh, you know, a thought is I want to go eat. Okay, so maybe that manifests in the sense of then I go make myself food and I go eat. But when I'm when I'm saying what really, what really is reflected back to you is not so much your thoughts as your beliefs. And what's the difference? The difference is a belief is a thought that's that has been repeated. It's it's like a decision that you yeah. practiced. Yeah, right. like a decision about myself. I'm a loser. I was told that by my mom and I decided it's true unconsciously. I didn't know I was doing it. And then I, 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 believe, I decided it over and over and over again in every situation. And the outcome I got always proved that I am a loser. You always get the outcome of the belief that you, that you have. But, not, but if I had the thought that says going into a game or something and, and my, my, my belief is I'm a loser, but I went in with the thought, that's okay, I'm a winner, we're going to win. That doesn't mean anything. That's not what's going to manifest. The, right. It's your what, belief that manifests. It's belief. Like it's whatever what, you what strongly practiced. Mm -hmm. what I, what I, the thought I've been practicing all my life, that's what's going to manifest. And, and, and by the way, a loser, even if he wins and good stuff start happening to him, like a, a guy gets the girl that he can't believe he even got her, he's going to 100% sabotage that and lose her because he doesn't believe this, he's deserving and worthy of her. That was, that's what happens with lottery winners a lot of times. They ruin their lives by winning the lottery, by the way. If they're not ready to, 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 be, to receive it. And like I told you, receiving is the most sick thing on this planet. 
people's ability to relax and receive is close to zero. So when really good things happen, they have a hard time really just saying, I don't need to do anything for this. It's okay, I can just receive it. No, they think they have to earn it and prove it because uh, they don't feel worthy enough. Mm. So in that sense, every location can create its own reality, right? It's basically, it's, it's, it's the thoughts that are believed in, right? So each person... It's not can create, it does create 100%. It's always happening. According to the beliefs. So in a way, we are still doers. Like we can change our reality. No, but you don't choose your beliefs. You don't choose your beliefs. You don't make them come or go, you know? Uh, if someone had really negative beliefs and then they came to a session with me or they came to uh, do the work with Byron Katie or whatever way they found to shift the belief, that's not that they did it. That That is something that happened. And then, so that was meant to happen. It just, it's yeah. just that go, go. they had to arrive at that by going yeah. through. That the, the illusion or delusion, if you will, is that then they write a book about how they shifted their mind and, and their life became wonderful, but they think that they did it. So they're writing in the book about how they did it. And then every other me is reading that book and trying to, to think, well, if I do that too, then I'll get the same result. And it doesn't really work that way because every, every shard has its own destiny and its own path. You see, the only person who, who the only people who will be able to use the book are people who are destined to learn from that book and to it's their it's their permission slip to change in the dream it's yeah. it's it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing because again the paradox is where it's at you you do when you are coming to Byron Katie or to some or to me or to some kind of way to to change your beliefs you you have to feel like you are responsible. You have to feel that. And yet in truth, you're not. So it exists in a paradox because if you don't feel that you're responsible, you won't make the change. If you don't feel that you're responsible, right. you won't make the change. You'll just say, you'll just wait for, for God or whatever. But God is, is you making the change right there in that moment. Okay. Wait, does, does, does that answer you, Rajani? Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Because we can, we can stay on it if you want. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense, yeah. And even if, if, even if that individual sort of gives up and says, I can't do anything about it, then that's what is happening. You know, yes. That's also yes. part of the play. Exactly. There's only what's happening, nobody's doing that. And if what's happening is a sense of, I am here taking responsibility for my life and changing my beliefs, then that's what's happening. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Great, thank you. Krishna. Yeah. What happens when there is no belief? So, It's a good question. You see, because I mean, I'm thinking. Question, I couldn't hear very well. What is the question Krishna asked? I, I couldn't hear Krishna. So what, what happens when there is no belief? So he what said happens? When there is no... no belief, when there is no belief. Uh, okay, okay. There's a lot of things, uh, in, a lot of ways to answer that. You see, for example, there is the, the sage that um, sits in some kind of a, otherworldly state it's not quite otherworldly but but he's kind of lost not lost not in a negative way in in a, in the deep sleep kind of state you know there's 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 all these meditators who can sit for weeks without eating or drinking it's because they're really it's really like sleeping the state they're in it's not that they're asleep like like that but they're like in the deep deep sleep where there's, they're not aware of their body. So it's not like they're trying to avoid and deal with the hunger and the, they're not feeling their body. So in that state, there's just no one. There's just no one. You're just, it's like there is nothing happening. 
nothing even appearing to happen. In the, the beliefs apply only to the place where things appear to happen and there's an ind individual appearing to create his or her, or her own reality. Now, this brings me to a good point because in the absolute, 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 absolute truth, anything can happen and it doesn't have to follow any law whatsoever. So that means in the, I don't want to confuse you guys, but in the absolute, 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 absolute truth, it has, it doesn't matter what the beliefs are. Anything can happen. However, it's very, 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 very obvious that there is an intelligence to this, to the dreamer, to this dream. There's intelligence. There is, there is something like, it's not quite rules, but there is something that it seems to follow in a consistent way. And the, re, the reason, this is all concepts, but nevertheless, the reason that, that it is that way is to give the dream more meaning, more of a, to make the play more interesting. Because it's more interesting when things don't just happen randomly and they have nothing to do with anything, you know, like one moment we're sitting here and the next moment we're in a helicopter flying above the Himalayas or whatever. It, that's, that's if the, if the dream had no consistency and no intelligence or a different kind of intelligence, anything could happen. Like one moment I'd be Daniel, the next moment I'd, I would be Krishna. Uh, and and I, we wouldn't even know that that swap happened. Anything, anything could happen, but it doesn't, usually happen that way every once in a while maybe something weird is introduced into the dream but normally there's a consistency and the way that the consistency works is that there is the rule of beliefs are reflected back to you from your reality so your reality becomes this feedback loop this feedback mechanism that enables you to see where you're at so for example you went to a career let's say that you're not really interested in if you weren't feeling a certain way about that, yeah, you wouldn't know that there is beliefs, the belief that you need to fit in that made you get that reflection, that reality, you see? So there is a logic and an intelligence and a consistency to it, yeah. But if you're talking about you getting to a state of no beliefs, that's a very unlikely. You'll probably die if you have no beliefs. And beliefs, by the way, I know, I know some teachers will say I have no beliefs. It, it means that that doesn't have any beliefs. Non-duality doesn't have any beliefs about how it should be or shouldn't be, or it doesn't think about itself like, oh, I'm a loser or that. It does that through you. The non-duality through its shards can think about itself. I'm a loser. I'm a winner. I'm good. I'm bad. I'm bad. Right. But it doesn't really make a difference to it because it doesn't become good by you thinking you're good. And it doesn't become bad by you thinking you're bad. It never becomes anything other than itself. There's never an other that comes into reality. But the, the, the existence of, let's say, a rock or a plant doesn't require beliefs. It's only the, the, the beings in the universe that experience themselves as self-conscious. The beings that, that you call their name and they, they know that you're talking to them. Self, separate self-consciousness, yeah? So a rock or a plant doesn't require belief. That's just the non-duality is dreaming that. And it's the same with you, except the only difference is that you have the sense of knowing that you exist and you have the sense of individuality, whereas a rock probably doesn't. So it, I, I guess the ultimate answer, the, the summary of the answer to your question is beliefs aren't required, but they're part of the play. Yeah, if it is there, it is there. If it is not there, yeah, you? but they're part of the play in order to to have the play be have some some apparent rules to it, some apparent something for you to 
to follow some guideline. Otherwise, it's total chaos. So I have a, a similar question on the same line. So if you have no belief, so you cannot exist as a physical object if you don't have any beliefs, would that be accurate, Daniel? If you have no beliefs? Yes. Well, the, what, what, we, what I said about the rock and the plant is that they don't require belief and they're physical. They're being- To us, to me. Huh? To me, they're physical. Not to themselves. No, they don't know themselves. Right. Right. I st I'm still not sure exactly what you were trying to say, though. Oh, you're, you're muted. So to appear as a physical object, me as Sib, like if I don't have any beliefs, I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't yeah, exist but, for so myself. I, right. It, so that's what every time I talk about knowledge, about knowledge, without knowledge, you don't exist. You don't know anything. You don't even know your own body. You don't know yourself. And that's what's there in deep, deep sleep. There's no knowledge, no beliefs, nothing, no ideas. So yeah, there's no existence of anything without knowledge. And that's the truth. There is no existence of anything. All knowledge is a dream. Anything you think you know, you just think you know it. The truth is there's absolutely nothing to learn, nothing to know. There's nowhere to get to. It all just happens. But there's a lot of things in the dream where it, 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 things just happen that make it seem as though there actually is a believer, a doer, a this, a that. There, there isn't really. It's all being dreamt. We are being dreamt. We are not real. Is it possible to know that you're not real even when the feeling that you're real is constantly there? A hundred percent. Yeah. Because the feeling is just an appearance. It's not a reality. Your knowledge of me is, is just an appearance. It's not a reality. Everything is a possibility of, of what that which is, the non-duality, is it's a possibility it's a reflection but the reflection is never a reality it's just a reflection so any any feeling thought knowledge belief whatever is just an appearance so so the moment that you begin to understand that it's just an appearance not a reality then yeah absolutely everything just appears but nothing's real and to get to that point of understanding, we should just like follow what you, you said, right? Uh, in today's satsang. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the mantra part. The so what? Doesn't matter. Who cares? Yeah. It's, right. Yeah. But also, of course, the part about fitting in and the part about guilt. Yeah. Because the, the moment it's, you see what, what all that does is it dissolves the, the illusory solid, solidification. Because once you take yourself to be real, the world becomes real to you. And you think this is really happening. And you think that you're a person trapped inside what's happening. And then you seek a way out. And there is no way out because it's not real in the first place. So by, by making it less solid, which by, by alleviating the guilt, by not trying to 
be someone you're not and by making it not matter, it becomes less solid for you. And then it's, it becomes very possible to see that this is just appearances. It's just non-duality appearing as this. But Daniel, uh, the moment you follow your passion, aren't you solidifying the me again? No, it's passion is also an appearance and the, the uh, appearance of, of I as a shard of the mirror, having my own calling, my own thing to follow, that's a dream. But it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It happens in a dream, not in reality. Everything is happening in a dream, not in reality. So you, you operate based on that understanding that the solid dream and still do what you have to do. Yeah, a hundred percent. You still do what you have to. That's what I'm saying. When you realize the understanding, if you will, it's funny because, because no one has the understanding, if you will, is that the non-duality in the duality, there's no, there's no two things like that. The non-duality is the duality, but only the non-duality is real. The duality is just the reflection of it, is just what it appears as. So you can't get rid of duality, nor can you get rid of individuality, but it's just the non-duality appearing as individuality and as duality. And it's appearing as someone who's having a unique type of passion and someone who has a unique calling. It's not real. There is no one, but that doesn't mean it doesn't appear. So you don't need to get rid of it for non-duality to be. It already is. It's just expressing in all these kinds of ways. Right. Guilt is I might be doing something wrong. Yeah, that's yeah. guilt, intense guilt. Yeah, I might be doing something wrong or I am doing something wrong. Yeah. And there, there is no, uh, it's just, you know, that's the me. That's, that's the very core of the me. And, and so the, the more intense it is, in a way, a lot of times you're closer to the, to the, to the pit, to the bottom of the me. Where there's a, a me is very, at the very bottom of it, there's a sense of, of fraudulence, of I'm a fraud. And there's a sense of I'm wrong. Yeah. And there's a sense of I'm afraid of being exposed because the me knows in a way, well, it tries to hide it with everything it's got, but it knows that it's not real, <laughs> but it's, it's an imposter trying to be real and trying to say, Hey, I'm really here. This is, this is real. And I do know what I know. And, and this happened to me and this is my knowledge. And see at the very bottom of that, it's like, there's, feeling of like oh shit none of that's true because none of that's real oops hmm. yeah it's very unpleasant it's not it's not that it's it, it's not a new guilt that guilt was always there it was just usually covered up you know, the ego will do anything to not be exposed. It'll do anything to survive. Like we said last week and also a little bit today, um, for example, it'll, it'll continue its victim story at any price because it prefers to be in terrible suffering and as a victim than to die. Because um, you think it's yours, that's why you take it so seriously. Anything that appears, you, 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 nothing can kill you. It's not like you think this feeling, feelings lie to you by, by being so intense that they, they make you think that you can die from a feeling. But I tell you, the feeling is not going to kill you. So stop giving it so much power. It's not all that, it's, all that it says it is. It's not all that it pretends to be. You are afraid of it. That's why it has so much power. But if you're no longer afraid of it and you don't take it seriously and you don't give a fuck about it, yeah, then you'll see it just, it has no power of its own. It has zero power over you. All the power that it's getting is from you. So no matter how heavy a feeling seems or how intense, whatever, 
you still have to know it's just a feeling. It can't do anything to you, and it's still just an appearance. So, you know, it's like you would say, if something appears very, very solid, then it's real. But if it appears very thin, then it's not real. But it doesn't matter. It's both equally an appearance. Whether it appears thick or thin, it doesn't, it's still an appearance. So if a feeling appears very subtle, it's an appearance. Space, the feeling of I am space, just another concept, another experience. Or the feeling very solid, intense, guilt, it's just another appearance. So don't be fooled. Yeah. Okay, let's see what we got. Uh, one more and then we'll, we'll close this. Una, did you want to ask something? No, that's great. I, it's, the one question I did have, but I think it was answered, is that if the self is working, <clears throat> is waking up to itself, and it's all just destiny, um, I thought I, I thought that was very chaotic. But then you did talk about there's an intelligence at play. Yeah. So yeah. That, yeah. So um, yeah. I mean, and you and you see that just by observing that there appeared to be rules there appears to be consistency yeah yeah so that was really helpful thank you today was great awesome